Hello, and welcome to the third installment of the 2023 season of Emory University's Health Storytelling Project, a Q&A series with authors of fascinating new books about health and science. I'm Maren McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University. And I'm the curator and host of this series. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, Amy Doxer Marcus, and her fascinating book from Riverhead Books, We the Scientists, how a daring team of parents and doctors forged a new path for medicine. But first, let me tell you about this series. Once per month, during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with society. This series of conversations originates at Emory's Center for the Study of Human Health, and the entire year of productions is co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, which is an affiliate of the Library of Congress, and Science Gallery Atlanta, which presents exhibits that live at the juncture of science and art and ignite creativity and discovery. And this year, for the first time, we've been joined by a new co-sponsor who I am thrilled to thank, the Decatur Book Festival, the largest independent book fest in the United States. Book fans may know that the DBF is taking a post-pandemic hiatus to rethink its goals and strategies. And in that pause, we're delighted to bring these authors in our series to that festival's passionate sponsors. So let me tell you who's been appearing. Our theme this semester is how patients identify illnesses that medicine initially does not recognize, and how patient communities are forced to become their own advocates and persuade researchers to collaborate with them. Tonight, as I mentioned, I'm in conversation with Amy Doxer Marcus of the Wall Street Journal, whose book, We the Scientists, How a Daring Team of Parents and Doctors Forged a New Path for Medicine, follows a group of parents whose children suffer from a rare fatal genetic condition and how those families desire to find a cure allows them to collaborate with and sometimes collide with the traditional structure of scientific research. In September, I talked to biochemist and science editor Quinn Eastman, author of The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up, hypersomnia, and the science of sleepiness. And in October, I talked to Jennifer London, an essayist and cultural critic whose American breakdown, Our Ailing Nation, My Body's Revolt, and the 19th century woman who brought me back to life interweaves London's experience of mysterious fatigue with the story of the brilliant, witty 19th century diarist, Alice James, who spent much of her adulthood bedridden. The series is live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and X, formerly known as Twitter, and archived on YouTube. So you can find those two recent conversations and all our author conversations since the autumn of 2020 on the YouTube account of the Center for the Study of Human Health. One final note, if you're watching us on November 2nd, you are experiencing a live event. You can interact with us and we encourage you to do that. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, your comments will come through our live stream platform. We apologize this integration doesn't work for Twitter, but you're welcome to post your comments and tag our account. If you comment, our producer, Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social, will make sure we see what you've said and will put your question up on screen when I pose it to our guest. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this 60 minute live stream, but you can put your questions in any of the chat boxes or send them to our account at any time. Now, let's turn to our book and guest. Amy Doxer Marcus has been a reporter for the Wall Street Journal for more than two decades. She first covered law 
and then moved to the journal's Tel Aviv Bureau, where she covered the Middle East for seven years. Then she became a health and science reporter, and in 2005, she won the Pulitzer Prize for Beat Reporting for a series of stories she did for the journal about the social, economic, and health challenges faced by people who survive cancer. She focuses on how scientific advances are transforming society. She writes about gene therapies and gene editing and citizen science. She's been reporting on the community at the heart of this book for more than a decade, and that reporting inspired her to earn a master's degree in bioethics at Harvard Medical School. She's also the author of the books Jerusalem 1913 and The View from Nebo, How Archaeology is Rewriting the Bible and Reshaping the Middle East. Amy, welcome to this series. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here with you. <laughs> I am very, very happy that, that you had time free that you could do this to talk about this amazing book. Um, I think it's probably fair to tell the audience that we actually know each other, but we haven't seen each other in a very long time. We shared a fellowship 15 years ago, 16 years ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, we were both members of a fellowship um, sponsored by the DART Society and the DART Center at Columbia University. And it was fascinating back then to hear Amy talk about the start of the work that became this book that we're now gonna talk about. So, so I think I wanna take us back to then. Um, so as I said in, in my introduction of you, um, you began as, uh, well, first you covered law, then you moved to the Middle East and you worked in the Middle East Bureau of the Journal. And then you came back to the US and you started reporting on new science around cancer. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that, about, about what you found at that time and how it framed your thinking about research? Yeah, I mean, it's, I really do think that the origin of the book actually goes back to that time. Um, I had noticed in reading and trying to get up to speed and understanding what was going on in cancer that there were new drugs coming on the market, there was a lot of excitement, and there was this growing sense among doctors and researchers that patients were going to be living longer with cancer. These new drugs couldn't necessarily cure the disease. You know, they couldn't sort of promise that you would be disease free. But what they were doing is extending your lifespan, sometimes dramatically. And I started thinking, what would that mean to sort of live longer with a disease? You know, how would you function in life? How would it affect your relationships? And I started working on a series of stories that ended up taking a full year. I was cautiously optimistic. I mean, some of the people I wrote about did end up passing away from the disease. I wasn't trying to argue that this is, you know, a panacea and that everybody's going to be cured. But certainly there was enough excitement about the drugs and others in the pipeline that people were talking more and more about living longer with the disease. And I, I sort of got to the end of that year in a, in a kind of hopeful sort of state that we were moving in the right direction. And from there, then you had this personal experience that showed you that maybe the, the new research and technology, new drugs that you had been learning about as a reporter had limitations. Can you talk about that? Yeah. It, I mean, it was quite shocking, I think, because I had been focusing so much on the more optimistic side. Um, what happened is in December, my mother all of a sudden out of nowhere, just sort of got this severe kind of pain, so severe, she was doubled over in such pain that my father rushed her to the emergency room at the hospital. At the hospital, they did this scan and they told her that um, she had gallstones and that was causing the pain and that she would need to have her gallbladder removed in order to alleviate the pain. Gallbladder surgery, the removal of the gallbladder, it's pretty routine surgery, I mean, for doctors that do it. And so she got the gallbladder removed and we thought that we would go back to our regular lives once that operation was over. But when doctors remove an organ, they send it to pathology as a, you know, a routine thing to check. And a week after the surgery, the surgeon called and told my mom and dad that my mother had metastatic gallbladder cancer. Mm. 
it was so shocking, uh, like overwhelming, because we really thought, you know, that everything was going to be fine after the surgery. And of course, as a reporter and someone who had focused so much on cancer, I jumped in. You know, I started doing research. I started calling oncologists. And what I learned was quite disheartening. My, the gallbladder cancer is a very rare form of cancer. The National Cancer Institute groups it with bile duct cancer. And even with grouping it with another form of cancer, there's only around 7,000 or so cases in the United States a year, which is very small you know, in comparison to breast cancer or prostate cancer and some of the better known cancers. And what I discovered that that meant was there wasn't a lot going on for my mom. The chemotherapy regimen that she was offered was a standard drug that had been around for decades. When I looked at the survival statistics, they were very uninspiring. People didn't live long once you were diagnosed with metastatic gallbladder cancer, generally speaking. And um, I, I grew increasingly frustrated that people with rarer sorts of diseases seemed to be overlooked and there wasn't much happening in terms of clinical trials or available therapies. And, and unfortunately your mother did pass away. She did. I mean, she went through treatment and she um, survived around two years, a little bit over two years, but she did pass away from her disease and of course, that was devastating and so sad for everyone in my family. And it's so striking to me that, and you talk about this in the book, that the the hopefulness, the the sense of optimism that you thought you had when you were were learning about new developments in cancer were so quickly undermined by your personal experience, in which um, you found that, there, as you say, there were so few cases, there wasn't a lot of data, what data there was wasn't being shared among institutions, so the physicians who were treating your mother wouldn't necessarily have experience with other patients to, to compare against. And it sounds like that collision between the first experience that you had and then the personal experience of your mother's illness really set you on the path that led to this book. I think it really did. Um, my mother was a really type of generous person who didn't really always think about herself. She was a community activist. She was always doing things in our community. And I think she kind of inspired me to think about this beyond our family's experience, because we knew that we weren't going to be able to find something to save her life. We were hoping to extend it for longer, but even that, the pickings were very slim in that department. And so in talking with her, she really sort of got me to think about, well, how could we look at this as a system-wide problem? Are there better models? Is there a way to do this that would help the next generation of patients after her? And I did set down a path especially after she passed away, because I wanted to sort of, my anger and my sadness and my frustration, I wanted to put it in a more useful way. Um, I did start to think more deeply, what, how could we do this differently? What's, what's wrong? Because she went to a great cancer center and she had a really wonderful oncologist. I mean, she had support, she had great doctors. She really was fortunate in so many ways, and yet the outcome was so poor. So it did make me start to think about how can we do this differently? And a, a few moments ago, you mentioned breast cancer and how many cases of breast cancer there are compared to how many cases of the cancer that your mother had exist. Um, and breast cancer is interesting also because there's such a patient advocacy community and, and not only for breast cancer, of course, and they may possibly in, in the modern era, I think HIV may set the model for that, but there have been repeated uh, instances of patients and patients' loved ones gathering together, creating advocacy communities. And so you started to take a look at those, right? I did. Um, I First I started out um, just making some calls and doing some research. And then when I thought about it in a broader broader way, I decided to apply for a grant because I knew I needed to do a bigger research project. Um, I got a health investigator award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And that allowed me to take some time off from work. It was hard being a daily news reporter 
you know, on a on a busy and demanding beat, and to also, you know, think about a huge project um, and digging in and doing research on something that I wasn't sure was going to end up in the newspaper. So I took some time off from work, and the goal during that period of time was, let me try to find groups of people advocates, families, patients who are trying to work in novel ways, innovative ways with scientists and researchers to advance rare diseases. I figured that some of the new models would be applicable to more common diseases as well, but a lot of innovation does happen in rarer diseases because it's just so much harder to get people's attention when, you, when you're in a rare disease group. So talk about how you found the community that you ended up writing about. And I'm sure most people, since it is so rare, most people who are watching this have probably not heard about the disease that this book is actually about. Yeah, the community I ended up focusing on um, are a group of parents whose children have a rare and fatal genetic disease called Neiman Pick disease type C. It's a cholesterol metabolism disorder. And essentially what happens is the cholesterol in the cell it's supposed to get broken down in, the, in a compartment of the cell that serves as a kind of garbage recycling center, and it gets processed and it helps your body function in all kinds of ways. It's really an essential, cholesterol is so essential to the functioning, our, the normal functioning of our bodies. But the cholesterol in these patients, people that are diagnosed with this disease, it gets stuck in the compartment, can't get out, and it starts to build up over time. Often, when the children are first born, people don't know that they're ill. They're not, you know, it doesn't manifest itself immediately. And instead, over the course of time, things start happening. You know, often some of the kids um, that I met, um, the teachers were the ones that noticed mm -hmm. that something was not quite typical. Maybe they tripped a lot in school. Maybe they had trouble following along in school. They would flag the parents. Parents would take them for some sort of, you know, get assessment, and it would set them on this diagnostic odyssey, resulting in this incredible, you know, horrible diagnosis, because there isn't an effective cure for this disease yet. Um, and it, it's a genetic disease, we all have this, we all have two copies of this gene. And in order to get this disease, you have to inherit a copy that's not functioning properly, one copy from each of your parents. So the parents are carriers. They have one normal copy and one not normal copy. So they don't know, they don't, they're fine. They don't know anything's go, gonna go wrong. But when they, if they meet someone and they have a child with that person and the child happens to inherit two copies, the child ends up with this disease. And that it sounds like that's, it's so rare to begin with. Oh, it's very, oh, there, sorry, there, yeah. there would be no consciousness in families unless there were multiple cases, right? Correct. If you had a child that had already been diagnosed, you would know to that it could happen again. But for many of the parents that I met, you know, this diagnosis came out of nowhere. And just, you know, I just wanted to sort of flag how we talked about with my mom that there were only 7,000 cases a year. Well, with this disease, uh, you know, when I started going down this road, the doctors weren't quite sure how many. They, they were estimating maybe 250 known cases in the US, maybe 500 known cases abroad, you know, internationally total. That's, that's not just rare, it's kind of like ultra rare, I would say. So the thing that's remarkable to me, and I think that, that we should stress this, is that um, even though this di disease was so incredibly rare, at the point at which you enter the story, there already is some patient advocacy going on, right? Like we're, we're going to talk about the particular people that you met, but I don't want to give the impression that they were the only people working on this disease. There, there already were some, some efforts and some sort of upwelling of organization. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the way I found these families to begin with was um, a government, an NIH official who had been meeting with the families and knew about them. He thought that they were trying to do some really innovative things that I might be interested in, and he connected me with them. When I entered into the community, I understood that, you know, there were um, several you know, prominent advocacy groups, research groups, the Parsegian Foundation, you know, Ara Parsegian, a famous coach for the Notre Dame football team, 
um, some of his grandchildren had been born with the disease and he, he and his family started a foundation that raised a lot of money and continues to raise a lot of money every year that went into research. There's a, there was a national foundation, the National Neiman um, Pick Disease Foundation still exists also, founded by parents, helped raise money for research. So there were things going on. Um, but even so, despite this, you know, you they still didn't have an effective therapy. And, you know, in some ways, that's even a great model because they're doing everything right. They're raising a lot of money. They're doing the basic research. They have interest by scientists and still no effective therapy. And it's really remarkable to me that at the point, again, the point at which you enter the story, the gene that causes the disease had already been identified. In fact, had been identified for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I think we think we think about genetic disorders and we think, oh, well, if we just find the gene, everything will be fine. And yet this is such an example of how genetic knowledge by itself isn't enough. Yeah, the genes interact. You don't know exactly what happens downstream. Um, there, you know, you're not quite understand, you're not quite understanding how everything processes, the cholesterol gets processed. There's so many questions. You know, it's a huge endeavor to unravel everything. And basic science, which really takes the long view, is so critical. I mean, so essential and can spark ideas for, you know, the translation of the science. And I think what the families that I was focusing on and the scientists that they ended up collaborating with to move this forward wanted to focus on is how do we move things more quickly, you know, from the bench to the bedside? How do we get this out of the lab? How do we get this into animals? And how do we get it out of animals into kids? How do we make that go faster in the lifetime of these kids? So now let's talk about how you found, how you decided to, to focus on these families, because there's several families who are very important in the book. Um, they, they end up pursuing different paths, supporting different drugs, different research efforts. How did you know that they were your characters? Yeah, I mean, I think it was just over time getting to know them. I mean, for one thing, one of the things I think that was essential to the reporting of this book is that the community was so welcoming and so open. I think it's very brave. I mean, when, you know, as when you're a health and science reporter, when you meet people, generally you're meeting them on the worst day of their lives. And if it's not the worst day of their lives, they've already had the worst day of their lives and you're asking to follow along. It's so painful. It, it, it's, and you, you know, you don't know what's going to happen and you're trying your hardest. You've got to take care of a child that has a serious illness, you, you maybe you have other children, you have your family, you have your job, and then you're trying to figure out a way to help, you know, your sick child or your sick children. And then a reporter comes along and says, hi, I'd like to be with you. I'd like to spend time with you. I'd like to come to your homes. I'd like to um, come to labs. I mean, the, the scientists were incredibly generous as well. And I think it was the combination of they, they were embarking on an unusual social experiment and they were trying to do something novel with the science that might be applicable to other conditions. And they were so generous about allowing me to be part of their community and observe things. I think all those factors together made me feel like, I think I just want to stay a while. I didn't realize how long a while meant, but I did want to stay a while. <laughs> Yeah, so we should probably say at this point when you say you didn't know how long a while was going to be that you actually wrote about this research that you were doing in, into the families who, of Neiman Pick um, it, for the journal in 2013. A and then you just kept on reporting. <laughs> yeah, and even then, like, you know, I I met them a few months after my mother passed away. You know, so I met them sort of at the beginning of my own kind of grieving process, in a sense, and my own thought process. I met them initially then. I kept following them for a few years. I started to realize that they were getting closer to um, thinking that they could launch perhaps a clinical trial to get to, to gather some early data. And I went to my editors and said, you know, I've been following these folks, started out as this project, you know, with my grant, and I've just kept going. But I think it's it's a story. And my editors agreed and allowed me to keep going for like a full year. I followed them 
and wrote about a full year of their efforts to launch a trial, you know, for the Wall Street Journal. So let me remind people that we would love to hear your comments and questions. You can put them in the chat boxes of wherever you're watching us, or you can tag our, our Twitter account. And in just a couple of minutes, we'll move to the portion of the um, of, of this live stream in which I ask your questions in addition to asking all of my own. So can, tell us about the families that you ended up focusing on, the families that you decided were representative of this, this very complicated reaching for some solution. Yeah, first of all, I just I want to say one thing before we start down that, which is I'm so grateful to all the families. Mm -hmm. And there were there were some families who were so generous with their time and their insights, but they couldn't be quoted. You know, sure. they didn't they didn't want to have names, you know, in a book or an article. Or there were other families where, you know, when you're working really, when you're writing about a community project, you can't put in a hundred different people because it's hard for a reader to follow along. So I did try to choose families that were representative of viewpoints and perspectives that I saw reflected in the wider community. But I'm really so grateful to everyone that spoke to me and everyone that I interviewed said, this was a community project. This is the community effort. But I did end up following um, Chris and Hugh Hempel, who had twin daughters who were both diagnosed with the disease. I followed Phil and Andrea Mar Morella, who have four children, two of whom had the disease, mm -hmm. two of whom who did not. Um, I, I followed a little boy named Dylan, um, and you know he was um, enrolled in the early kind of natural history study and was also enrolled in the early phase of the clinical trial. I mean, all these families represented you know, different perspectives of how you might go about thinking about how to advance a drug and how to find a cure, or at least how to um, have your children live for as long as possible, if not a cure. And so there, I think you're touching on one of the central tensions of the book, which is the, the tension between the parents, the families, who want their children to be treated if there's any hope, who are focused on the individuals and scientists who have to look beyond the individual to gather data, not just hoping to save the life of this one child, but looking toward, as you say at one point in the book, um, children who might've been born, but not yet diagnosed and children yet to be born who might be at risk of the disease. That, ongoing tension in the book between what the parents need and what the scientists desire is so profound. I think it's the type of tension that also you see in any kind of disease because that doesn't have an effective therapy yet, of course. And, and that's because it takes a really long time for um, first for the scientists to figure out maybe what's causing this disease? You know, where can we best intervene to change the outcome of this disease? Then it takes a long time to find promising, you know, drugs. It takes a long time to get permission from regulatory authorities to test the drugs in animals and then in people. And, and also there is a kind of ethical tension in that the scientists tend to think about, you know, what's the, um, how can we generate generalizable scientific knowledge I think the parents wanted to do that too. They wanted to generate scientific knowledge that would be applicable to the community, but they had a much shorter time frame which in which they wanted to do that and they had other kinds of ideas on how can we generate information that might end up benefiting our own children, not just generations to come. The parents, you know, especially being in a rare community where you know everybody personally, you know, everybody, you know, the faces, you know, the names, you meet the families. Nobody um, wanted to somehow harm any other child in the community, but the children's disease progressed at different rates. Parents had a different sense of the risk and benefits. And so they ended up making choices based on how they felt where their own children were, while also keeping an eye on the long range view as well. I think this is a good time to bring in one of the questions from the folks who are watching us. Um, this is from Katie Stakowitz. Uh, and she asks, um, from a patient advocacy perspective, what's the balance between wanting a safe therapy, which might take a lot of time in testing, or wanting a quick therapy, which 
could be deployed faster, but also from the scientific side might have a larger risk, but larger reward? Well, this is an amazing question. And I think gets to the heart of why this is so challenging. So for example, I think, I mean, I think the, the answer to this would be try to find ways that you can collect data in a standardized fashion that can be available to the, all the scientists in the research community and has regulatory sort of oversight. So all the families involved, um, they ended up choosing some different types of paths, but all these paths require them to have a partner that was a doctor and to get permission from the FDA. So for example, the Hempel family, they availed themselves of the compassionate use um, program that the FDA does have. You have to have a doctor involved and a hospital involved, but you're allowed to get access to, to drugs that are still experimental, not approved yet, um, but that there's enough sort of science that the doctors assess that they think it's, you know, that the benefit may outweigh the risk. And they got access to one of the drugs that the larger community was interested in pursuing to get FDA formal approval for down the road if it worked. Now, the challenge of that is if you get the drug that way, the data may or may not be useful for the FDA if they're assessing whether the drug works at, when they're looking at a drug approval and you take children out of the running to be part of the so-called gold standard of clinical trial where patients are divided into two arms and some people get the drug and some people don't get the drug and you study them and try to see if you know the people that get the drug are doing better. So that was another, so I think that's a, a way to generate information that's useful that allows some families who can't wait for a formal trial to get up and running to gather data while also allowing um, a standardized gold trial to hopefully move forward too. And the FDA was involved in both those options. I, I don't think people understand, and I, I've heard this myself at FDA meetings, the, the, um, the challenge of having a therapy that it looks like it may work, but only, um, but not having very much data and people who have family members who need that therapy, pressing, pressing, pressing to be able to use it in compassionate use and the FDA, an FDA committee saying back to them, we want to save the life of your person, but we are going to lose that data. And there aren't that many cases and we need all the data we can get. And so it's not just for that, for this disease that meetings I'm talking about have been about bacteriophage therapies. And we should probably talk about how there were two main drugs that, that your story is about. I mean, not only those two, but sort of two, not two arms, but two paths that the families could take. Yeah, so there was already an FDA approved drug for a different disease, not for the disease that these children had, called um, called Zavesca. It had been approved for Gaucher disease, which is another uh, genetic disease, you know, lysosomal storage disease where something's not going right with the processing in the cell. And that drug had shown some promising signs in mice and they created a, a clinical trial. The drug company created a trial to try to give it to people with Neiman Pick disease type C to see if it worked. Now, while because that drug had already been approved by the FDA for a different disease, doctors did start prescribing it off label to patients with NPC disease. So a lot of children would get prescribed this drug. It wasn't a cure for the disease, but there was enough promising data that the doctors wanted to give it to, um, to, the, to the children. And during the course of um, my reporting, the there was the clinical trial ended and the it didn't show enough benefit to allow the FDA to approve to approve the drug. So to this day, people with NPC disease still get this drug, but off label. And when it's off label, insurance companies don't always reimburse for it. Mm -hmm. So when then there was a second drug the one that these families wanted to pursue in this unique collaboration that I was following, that was called cyclodextrin. That drug wasn't being developed by a drug company. And so it was available for parents to order it 
online with permission with doctors to apply for permission for compassionate use and for the NIH and then eventually a drug company came in later to organize clinical trials. So there were two paths and the failure of Zavesca to get approved by the FDA for their specific disease led many of the scientists to be very fearful that something similar might happen to this other promising drug. So it kind of had a cast a shadow over the, the efforts that the parents eventually got involved with, with the cyclodextrin drug. So th there's something that kind of uh, that underlies or is the shadow behind everything we're talking about with these, uh, the, the, these hopeful drug trials and the compassionate use of drugs. And that's the economics of drug development, which I think a lot of people don't actually know that much about. And it's certainly been a surprise to me as someone who writes about antibiotics, how long it takes to develop a drug and how risky, amazingly, the, the financial landscape of drug development is. You talk about this in the book that from an initial compound being recognized as being useful, it can be more than a decade and extraordinarily expensive um, for a company to, with academic partners to develop a drug. And if it's going to be taken forward, there have to be all kinds of calculations made about how big is the market? How many people are going to benefit from this? How, how, what kind of investment do we need to make to get this through to FDA approval? And, and so uh, you, you mentioned this early in the book that sometimes the best drugs or the most needed drugs might not go forward because the financial support just isn't going to be there. Absolutely. I mean, that is a huge hurdle and even bigger when you're talking about ultra rare conditions. I mean, a pharmaceutical company trying to assess if they want to take this risky path of investing so much money and trying to develop a drug and with no guarantee that, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have an FDA approved drug. I mean, they're, they look at a market of 500 versus a market of a million you know, patients, and they tend to go to the larger diseases. Now, one of the things that was so novel about this collaboration is that the NIH itself had been thinking about this problem. And the parents partnered with a group at the NIH, a lab led by Chris Austin, who's no longer at the NIH, but was at the time. And one of the things that the NIH was thinking about is, can we find a way to accelerate the development of drugs by bringing in patients and families early in the process. We're going to put a lot of money in ourselves, not only to help these patients, but to try to invest in the model. Can we develop a new model that would accelerate drug development um, by de-risking things, by moving more quickly, and that would enable companies to come in? And so the NIH ended up putting in over $15 million of their money there was also investment in terms of labor by scientists at Johnson & Johnson. It was kind of a pro bono project. The scientists worked on this drug to try to um, work on the chemistry of it so that it could be given to the children. And the parents themselves raised significant amounts of money. The foundations raised money and the parents had their own family foundations that raised money. All of this together, I mean, that's very hard for families to do without some help. Um, and that was part of this experiment, not only to look at the drug, but to come up with a model that might make it less expensive down the road and make it faster down the road so more companies could afford to do it. So part of the thing that made this situation so extraordinary, uh, and you talk about this at the end of the book as a model potentially going forward, is, is the ways in which the families challenged the scientists to to collect to use data and collect collect data in a way that would not fit the traditional research model that perhaps they could collect data even from kids who are getting drugs on compassionate use and not have to worry about having the traditional randomized double blinded placebo using um, uh, data delivering structure. D do you feel like that worked? That that, that this this plea to to extract data from non-standard situations was something that the researchers listened to? I think they struggled with it at first, but I think they came around in part because there was encouragement by FDA and NIH to, to think about it that way. Of course, you know, they have not yet 
um, they didn't succeed yet in having a, having the drug approved by the FDA. They're still working on this project. You know, the drug itself has been bought a number of different times, and there's another company that's working on it, hoping to perfect it. But the thing that I think that they did that was so profound is they argued that they should be partners. The traditional model is that patients are research subjects. They said, we want to be partners from day one. We want to work together. We want to assess the data together. We want to collect our own data and we want to we want to assess it with you, with the data that you're collecting. Um, we want to assess things. They ended up writing papers with the scientists and publishing them. They ended up being collaborators in so many ways that I think are really quite transformative and provide a model for a lot of other diseases, not just rare diseases and not just their specific disease. So this is probably a good time to talk about the disease that has obsessed all of us for the past couple of years, and that's COVID. And not just COVID, but long COVID, which has emerged as the, 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 the thing that we will remember COVID for, this mysterious syndrome, complex of symptoms that dogs people for months or years afterward. It sounds as though the long COVID community has managed to do what some other, maybe just because of its size, has managed to do what some other uh, rare disease communities have wanted to do and not been so successful at. And that is to first to insist that they be listened to, but, but second to bring the wealth of data that they themselves have gathered on themselves and, and share it with research and have it be considered valuable. Yeah, I mean, they've been a very effective community. I know that they've experienced frustrations as well with um, wanting to be heard. I think part of it is that at the beginning with COVID, nobody was an expert. The doctors didn't know anything more than the patients did. And then because it was so acute with, with doctors focused on people in the hospitals who were dying, um, the patients themselves who were suffering from symptoms that just didn't go away, even if they didn't have to be in a hospital, it was really affecting their lives and their health. They self-organized. They took advantage, of course, of being able to use the internet, chat groups, Slack channels to, to um, gather data together um, and to uh, and tweeting out at each other so they could they could organize themselves. They were able to um, get access to some funding because um, they formed a, an effective group that um, philanthropists were willing to fund. They had partners that were willing to work with them. And they've created some tools that I mentioned in the book that encourage new models of collaboration and provide sort of questions and things you should look for to know that a collaboration is um, is one that takes and puts the patient at the center of things. So I and I and they themselves acknowledge that they built on the work of these other communities that came before them. There, there are lots of questions coming in, so let me ask some of them. Sure. Um, so uh, Jillian asks, um, through, through your exploration of these efforts, parents, doctors, and the challenges they faced, now, where did you come out thinking about the healthcare system, positive or negative? Oh, wow, what a great question. I mean, here's the thing, you know, systems are really, it's, it's really hard. I mean, th there are, as a system, I think there's a lot of improvement that needs to be done. I mean, it's just so overwhelming. I think what I ended up feeling really positive about is the ability of groups who can, um, organize themselves can affect the system, but I I also felt sad and wished that they didn't have to be, have to do this. You, you know, when I was um, giving talks about uh, the book when it first came out at, at bookstores, parents of children with other rare diseases would sometimes stand up and ask questions. And mm -hmm. one of the moms said something that I still think about to this day. She said, I'm working so hard I'm partnering, I'm doing everything, I'm raising money, I'm trying to advance the science, but but why? Why do I have to do this? It's it's such a huge labor and she's so right. It's a tremendous labor. And in the book I do talk about ways that I think that we can lower the burden and I think in answer to to Jillian's question is we need to find ways to make the system work better 
for patients to make it easier for families to gather data, to interface and meet with regulators if they have ideas, to learn, to go to boot camps so they can learn how to be more effective if they want to set up their own uh, research organization, to work as partners with scientists and maybe even apply for grants to do research, to be, to be allowed to generate knowledge from their daily lives in ways that are effective and can be used. I, I have a lot of ideas that I try to talk about in the book, and there are so many people out there that have even way better ideas than I do that are really thinking about how to do this differently. I think we can change the system. So I guess maybe in the end, I'm an optimist and hope that we can um, improve things in the future. So I wanna ask a bit about your personal experience in, in uh, exploring this, um, because you tell us right at the start of the book that this is a disease that is rare and is fatal and children, um, children begin their lives looking normal, but they may not live past their teens. And, uh, Almost every child, not 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 to utter a spoiler, but people are probably expecting this. Just about every child that you write about in the book dies, uh, and uh, I wonder what that, the impact of that was on you. Well, I got to know the children and the families very well, and I was devastated when they passed away. Um, Dylan was one of the sweetest little boys, really just so charming and what a wonderful personality. And I think about him all the time still. And the Hempel's twins, you know, passed away. And one of the Morella's children passed away. And many other people who aren't named in the book passed away. And, but one of the Morella's children who has the disease, he's still alive. And he's, he takes the drug that his family along with a lot of other scientists and a lot of other families and you know the whole community effort, he, that, he's taking that drug still to this day. And he's doing better probably than his parents even expected at the beginning. And so I think what was so inspiring about these families is they always went into it very clear eyed, you know, about what the challenges were gonna be and the obstacles. And, um, and yet they kept going. So many of the families are still involved. They're still trying to push this drug forward and do research on other drugs. They help one another out. And so as much as it's devastating that you know so many of the kids aren't making it, I think that you have to go into anything, um, kind of like what my mother said, you know, you, you, you have to, Think about the community and you have to find ways to move the community forward and to just keep your eye on making it better, both for the children who are alive now, make their lives better, keep them going maybe for the next drug discovery and gather the information away to help other children down the road. We have a question from uh, someone who's watching us from Cora who wants to know how you... Um, how did you distance yourself from this very emotional experience and enough to be able to write the book? Or, I mean, did, was it advantageous to be so connected to these folks? Were you able to back away enough to get, get some perspective on it? How did you navigate that for yourself? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. And um, I mean, I don't know if there's really a great answer. I think that I, I think that it's hard to sort of distance yourself in the sense of you can't help but feel emotion. I mean, you know, you get to know people and you get to know their families and you get to know the scientists and, you know, they're good people, all of them, such good people. And so I think what you try to do is I feel like my job is to to sort of be a guide for other people to come into a community and to sort of meet the people. And I, I try to think of it that way, that I wanted to be, I mean, I, I can't know exactly what they're going through as much as they were welcoming and open. I'm not able to be them because my life experience is different than them. But what I try to do is to, you know, understand the humanity at the center of what they were trying to do, human to human, mom to mom, person to person, and then to say to, and then to write it in such a way that 
people could say, you know what, I may not know someone with this disease, but I do know people that have diseases. I do know what it is to be worried about a child. I do know what it is to love someone who's who's ill and to be nervous and to be scared. So I try to focus on the emotions and experiences that we all share in common so that everyone who read it could say, it doesn't matter if I know someone with this disease, I know people who are sick and need help and I relate to that on a human level. So I wanna ask you to, to return to what you said a moment ago um, about how you have a lot of thoughts about how this could work di differently and better research structures. And Gia, who's watching on YouTube asks, what's your perception of the present stance of researchers and medical professionals in, in patients informing their own care? And what needs to be done for a new system to really take off? Yeah, that's a great question. And first of all, I do want to say one thing, which is the, the protections that exist, um, you know, are designed to protect patients and they're necessary. I never argue in the book that there should be a free for all and that the ethical restrictions and the institutional review boards that look at things and all the protections that exist with FDA having to look at things, these these are there for a reason. And one of the reasons is, is that patients are extremely vulnerable. And another reason is that patients, there's a power gap and a knowledge gap, you know, and when you're sick, particularly, you're especially vulnerable. Even if you're incredibly educated and smart and you have lots of thoughts, you're vulnerable, you're ill. And so it's important. It is important. But what I have argued for is that patients who want to participate, who want to be at the table from the first day, who who um, have a lot of ideas and want to almost, you know, become producers of scientific knowledge, not just consumers. I think there are ways to help them get up to speed. I think that there are, I think that the FDA could have ombudsmen, you know, that are able to speak with patients who do want to get involved with the process. The NIH has created resources, patient toolkits that they um, created in combination with families um, from a variety of different disease groups that have walked this road and walk you through the steps on how do I partner with a researcher? How do I raise money? How do I do genetic testing? These um, uh, toolkits are available on the NIH's website and they're free, they're public information, but people don't always know that they're there. Like we have to think creatively about how to give people access to the resources that do exist because we need to um, engage people more where they are and bring them into the process. And, and answer more directly to the question, I think that there are a lot of researchers today who feels who still feel uncomfortable with this model. And yet I think there are a lot of researchers who, who don't feel uncomfortable at all with this model and who are eager to work as partners. And one thing I love to see in medical schools, the same way that medical schools often bring in patients with diseases to speak to medical students about what it's like to live with a particular disease, why not bring in patients who've created new models of working collaboratively to speak to the next generation of doctors so they can understand what they need to know on how to be a partner with a patient. Because part of the um, healing process is doctors, even when they don't have cures, can be part of healing patients by offering them hope that they can work together to gather information that might benefit benefit them to extend their lives and help others. And, and that's another program I'd like to see done in medical schools as well. So we've got just a couple of minutes left and um, I'm, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and ask my own question, which is you have spent so long with this story. Um, you, you met these people mm, 15 years ago and, and you wrote a series about them and you stayed with them and you wrote a book about them and the disease hasn't gone away and the advocacy and the search for a cure hasn't gone away, but, but what's next for you? Are, are you staying with this story? Do you have other things to do? Can, can you envision extracting yourself from it after such a long time? Well, I'm, 
I don't want to extract myself in the sense that I'm, I want to continue to follow the community. Um, they have some other promising leads and they haven't given up on cyclodextrin. I'd like to see the end of the cyclodextrin story. I'd like to see if they eventually are able to persuade the FDA that it should be an FDA approved drug. And, you know, that can take decades in some cases with some drugs, I, you know, um, as you gather more data. So I, you know, I feel it, I'm in, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm committed to following this story wherever it goes and wherever it takes me. But I am, you know, I'm a daily news reporter. I work for the Wall Street Journal. I cover health and science. I meet patients and families and people who are um, working on all kinds of issues, you know, every day. That's my job. My job is to get at the intersection of science and society. And so I consider it not only my job, but my honor and my privilege, and even like a blessing to get to meet people who are so engaged with trying to change things for the better, trying to help themselves and to help others as well, and to really engage as advocates in arguing for better health and better opportunities for all of us. I think we all benefit when people, you know, when citizens get involved, we, we all are beneficiaries, whether we know it or not. Is there any one lesson from meeting these families and following this journey that you take into your other stories? That I think that um, even when people don't see eye to eye, even when they disagree on maybe the path to follow, I think that people can come together, form communities and figure out their differences. Um, you don't have to agree with each other to find ways to generate information that can be potentially beneficial to everyone. I, I think there's a lesson there that we can apply in all aspects of our lives. I think I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> Amy, thank you so much. This was a fascinating conversation. Um, so folks, that's it for this edition of the Health Storytelling Author Q&A series. Please consider following Amy's work at the Wall Street Journal and on Twitter, formerly known as X, where she's Amy D. Marcus, and buy her book, which came out this year, which is available at her publisher, Riverhead Books, part of Penguin Random House, and at Amazon, of course, and also at bookshop.org which is the anti-Amazon. It's a platform that funnels orders to independent bookstores. And if you like going to bookstores, we urge you to follow the link that we'll provide for IndieBound.com. That site will show you which independent bookstore near you is carrying Amy's book or can order it for you. And that concludes the last episode in this semester's iteration of the Health Storytelling Project of the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health. To remind, you can find all of our conversations this semester, tonight's with Amy Doxer Marcus, the previous months with Jennifer London and Quinn Eastman on our YouTube channel, as well as author conversations from the past three years. We'll be back in January with a fresh set of authors discussing fascinating new books. In the meantime, this series is hosted by the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University and co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, Science Gallery Atlanta, and the Decatur Book Festival. On behalf of all our sponsors and from me, thank you for watching.